Hi there, now today's video is about the Motorola HT600E uh, UHF handheld radio that was used by um, the UK police forces and, uh, and obviously other public uh, service, emergency services around the world including the United States and other countries and uh, this radio uh, was a a 99 channel UHF radio um, very well made lasted many years I think it was made in the late 1980s early 90s onwards and it was quite advanced for its day um, obviously it had a maximum number of channels um, programmed in of 99 channels and it had scan capability as well uh, which you can set with this switch you can program your own scan channels up to a maximum of eight channels and a priority channel you can select um, the channel selection higher up and down and uh, it's had a remote speaker microphone as well which had a high and low speaker switch and PTT switch on the side a remote aerial on the top um, so when you connected the remote speaker microphone to the top of the radio for example um, then it would disconnect this antenna for receive and transmit and there's a pin switch inside which I'll show you shortly that routes it to one of these four pins and there's a centre of a coax and ground of the coax going up the microphone cable to the antenna socket on the microphone but uh, they were a good radio, they lasted decades uh, in use until the digital services brought about by Airwave replaced them uh, these were maintained by the Home Office Directorate of Telecommunications where I used to work and uh, we used to look after tens of thousands of these it's nearly every police force in the country had one of these, all police officers had them and they wore this on their lapel um, and this was in a holster on the body on the side and they did um, very well they were very well made indeed they don't make them like this anymore um, in competition later on in years when these radios became quite you know long in the tooth um, there were a lot of competition in the market there was a company called Cleartone in the UK that manufactured a, a, a competitive radio to this which some forces took up and it was called the Cleartone CH150 and it was similar in size um, but it had I think a maximum of 256 channels as well on that one and it had uh, if I remember the up and down buttons instead of being on the top were actually on the side there was an up and down button here and it had a sloping display here and then it went in again so and it was smaller as well uh, lighter radio because it's quite heavy this is going on for like just under a kilo in weight is this and uh, you know very well made but extremely heavy um, and they also made a remote speaker microphone for the clear tone CH150 as well so again um, very good radio very loud on receive and the transmit speech and everything and the the transmitted in 2 watts RF output power on UHF the banding of these was 438 to 470 megahertz um, they did do a VHF version, which uh, some police forces in the UK that were on FM on VHF used, uh, but they were mainly UHF uh, because there was a home office allocation across the UK for all police forces to operate in the UHF radio spectrum. Uh, they were allocated originally the 450 to 453 megahertz band for receiving the base station on and the transmit frequency from the handle to the base station was 13.9 megahertz higher so for example if you're receiving on 451.675 megahertz you would transmit back on I think it was 465.3 whatever it was megahertz so 13.9 megs higher and that was a split between transmit and receive frequency they did use CTECSS on some radios uh, because I think some of the police forces that were on the eastern side of the UK used to pick up telephone calls to Norwegian fishermen because the uh, frequencies that they used for telephone patching to Norwegian fishing vessels 
I think in the Baltic Sea and other parts of the Northern Hemisphere were on the similar frequencies to what the police in the UK used and they would occasionally in the summer months break through when you could hear phone calls but you couldn't understand what they were saying because they were speaking in Norwegian but uh, I think some of the phone calls were a bit saucy as well so between husband and wife so we used to uh, fit CTCSS um, on them or program the base station and, and the handles with CTCSS they did a mask encrypted version as well uh, which was a a later um, retrofit kit that came available for these and MASK stood for Marconi Analog Secure Communications and it was a, an analog encryption um, I think it was a Pseudo rolling code encryption algorithm and basically Motorola made like a, a front similar design to this but it was much thicker it was like a big bubble on the front and the mask encryption board went about here inside the radio there was a little room for it and then the loom for the mask encryption board had to be fitted into the controller flex assembly which I'll show you shortly and that's uh, how we allowed them to work with mask encryption as well and other types of encryption standards but there were retrofit kits that had to be done separately but they're very sensitive on receive about neg 120 dbm about uh, 0.2 of a microvolt on receive on the uhf to get them to open squelch uh, the squelch is all programmable and settable per channel in the radio which on another video i'll show the programming of the radio on the software um, likewise a transmit deviation the tx power um, and everything is all is all settable uh, actually no, the TX power is uh, manually set on these with a, a capacitor which I'm going to show you very shortly. So another competitor around about the time when these were getting a bit uh, long in the tooth was Kenwood. And Kenwood came about with their equivalent of the Motorola HT600E uh, which can be seen here. And it's a uh, similar size to the HT600 but again a lot of police forces started buying these, they were a lot cheaper. Uh, because I think, if I remember rightly, the price point for the Motorola HT600E, just for the radio alone, without the battery, was around about £900 to the home office, I think, back in the mid-90s. Uh, then the battery was an extra, I think, £60 on top. Then you add the charger as well. There's a single-way charger or multi-way charger that you can buy for these, which I've got and um, it, it basically ended up being quite an expensive affair when you bought a Motorola radio I don't know how much the speaker mic was, uh, that, that wasn't cheap but uh, again, you know, you're looking at a thousand pounds per radio even after discount with a Motorola but of course Kenwood came along with their offering uh, which was a TK350 uh, again, same frequency band in UHF, VHF models, they did all all the models for various applications they cornered the market really did Kenwood um, the price point of these was a lot lower they did a lot more channels the display was bigger and better um, you could order these without mask encryption already installed uh, if you needed that and they also got the ambulance market as well because a lot of the paramedics on the ambulances uh, ended up getting Kenwood radios the police had a lot of these across the country very lightweight in comparison to the Motorola and you did have a remote speaker microphone that plugged in to the side on these but it didn't have the aerial on the on the mic but it, that didn't matter much um, and they were very similar in design where the module comes out as a complete unit from the case just like it does on the Motorola so that's a little bit of a rundown so the, 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 there were other competitors in the UK that had quite an established market even around when Motorola came in and that was a company called Pi and Philips Telecom which then later became Simoco and then became Supura which now manufacture uh, Tetra radios for the emergency service market digital I think Supura was a hived off part of the Simoco digital business and I used to go down to St Andrews Road in Cambridge because um, the organisation I worked for in my career one of the jobs I had bought out uh, Philips Telecom 
and uh, we basically took over the entire factory and business down in uh, Cambridge and the forces down near Cambridge uh, all mainly had uh, Pie Phillips and Simoco gear they were quite loyal uh, to Philips Telecom and Simoco so the radios in the cars instead of being burned at Marconi radios in the road traffic cars and Motorola UHF handhelds uh, for the police officers on the beat they were mainly around those force areas near Cambridge um, Philips FM 1100s in the in the cars and uh, they had a lot of uh, what were back in the good old days Pi PFXs they were a synthesized version that's very similar size to the HT600 I haven't got one here to show you at the moment but the Motorola HT600 was a similar size to the Pi PFX and uh, they also had uh, PRP 73s and 76s I think which were again a, another variant that came after them and um, ultimately ended up on Supura when Airwave Tetra came in uh, to replace the analog radio systems so I've opened up a Motorola HT600E to show you what it's like inside and obviously uh, just move those out of the way it just basically slides out the case by undoing these two screws at the bottom the whole radio module slides out after you've unplugged the, the speaker and then what you've got inside is you've got uh, this is a radio board internally and uh, believe it or not these used to be repaired to component level we used to repair these uh, right down to component level you've got a service manual and a diagram with these as well as all the technical theory of operation etc this is a controller flex I've taken that out of its case it has a protective casing um, so that basically just sits in there like that in its case and uh, this is where the code plug as Motorola called it would be saved to um, so all the programming information and everything would be stored on EEPROM in here and this was a controller flex it actually opens up like a book but it was quite advanced for its day because it's not actually a printed circuit board a solid PCB it's a, a flexible uh, tape PCB which is on a metal backing which you can see sandwiched in the middle and uh, this was quite new technology back then and um, BGA devices as well well the, some of them were BGA partially and then with connections around the edges there but they were all mainly um, you know mass produced obviously um, but very very advanced really for the day considering you know we just left the crystal radios in that era and gone to synthesized and synthesized radios were fairly you know um, basic at the time because like the Pi PFX's you actually had a physical EEPROM used to remove to program separately and then put back in the radio and it was a bit of a mess so you had you didn't have that problem with the Motorola's you had the separate software you programmed them by plugging in a programming lead here and then um, it talked to the controller but the added advantage of this was that unlike other radios um, you had soft spots or software programmable analog levels so you could change the TX deviation the squelch um, you could control various parts of the what would normally be an analog adjustment on the board was all done by software and again that was quite new back in the day so I'll just take you through what's uh, inside it I can find a little pointer so at the bottom here this is the synthesizer board and this is the VCO voltage controlled oscillator that produces the transmit frequencies and the receive injection frequency uh, this is the reference oscillator um, that produces a reference signal for the VCO and the synthesizer um, that's the potentiometer to adjust the um, center frequency of the reference oscillator so that's how you adjust the frequency accuracy of the transmitter or the offset uh, this is a TXPA module and uh, the TXPA module had an, a, a capacitor on top which is adjusted for maximum RF output power and uh, that produced 2 watts maximum RF power the VHF models did uh, up to 5 watts 
um, so you could obviously get a VHF radio that did 5 watts um, that's the pin diode switch module um, so when you connect a remote speaker microphone on the top or an external antenna adapter um, you connect two pins on the top of the radio using the uh, adapter plug um, there's an antenna select pin and the sort of diagonal you short two pins out here in the plug that connects and then what it did it switched the pin diodes in the module over so that it would route the RF in a different path to the external antenna pins on the on the socket on the top uh, these two coils helical coils here were for the receiver front end adjustment <coughs> excuse me and uh, these were adjusted to give maximum receiver sensitivity performance on the mid frequency of the entire band that you were you were looking at um, and you'd adjust those for the reasonable sensitivity of the receiver uh, under here this flex connects to another PCB which is very difficult to see but it's stood on its edge that's the IF PCB the what is the discriminator the FM discriminator and these are the IF filters underneath for the first and second IF um, which you can see here and uh, this transistor down here is the um, exciter for the PA so we have low level RF leaving the VCO assembly on transmit goes to this amplifier to be boosted up to around about 500 milliwatts of RF on UHF before it's passed into the RF power amplifier module. This is the connector for the display. Obviously, we've got the volume pot, and um, the rest of it's all sort of um, part of the IF and RF. Um, the mixer, I think, is there. The RF front end amplifier was actually built into these coils, if I build it, if I remember rightly because um, these used to pack in as well we used to have to replace those um, and yes yeah, so there was obviously a lot of metal on it um, the dome contacts for the switches and the battery flex for the battery connection and you know these were very tough radios I mean they, they didn't break often you know with uh, 